school and they still wouldn't, wouldn't do particularly well. So, All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, get some of this GI stuff out of the way or kind of wrap some of this GI stuff up the best we can. And so I thought what I'd do is I'd put some of the, the more noteworthy um, issues and then we could talk about them. We'll, we could identify key findings, identify what they are, what the key findings are, and what the key therapies are gonna be. And um, as you might imagine, with gastrointestinal illnesses or presentations in general, a lot of it's gonna be that low-hanging fruit, that supportive care. Um, anybody with abdominal pain should have a 12 lead done on them. You know, really, we know that abdom abdominal pain can, can masquerade as an acute coronary syndrome and vice versa, so get a 12 lead on them. Unless it's pretty clear what you're dealing with, you know, if it's a six-year-old patient that has um, right lower quadrant pain and a fever and has been throwing up and um, has, you know, positive colon sign and, you know, McBurney's point tenderness, and, you know, it's just so, so completely obvious it's slapping across the face, then, you know, 12 lead probably not, not necessarily indicated, but most adults that have abdominal pain, you should probably get them a, a get a 12 lead and just be as broad as you can and then work, work your way. Uh, IV therapy, even if they're not necessarily vomiting and you don't need to give them meds or you're not going to give them fluids, why is an IV probably a good idea on most of your abdominal pain patients? Give some metformin yeah. later, and if they become dehydrated, it's going to okay. be harder to, to establish. Okay, and they may end up going to the OR, right? They may end up requiring um, what we call a, uh, what's a, what is a, a surgical procedure involving making an incision in the abdomen? general term for that. Acute abdomen? Well, acute abdomen is, a, is any condition which, which ne necessitates uh, going to the OR. Um, it's called a laparotomy. Just like a craniotomy is just a general term that means to open the head up, right? Open the cranium. Laparotomy is a general term that means um, <coughs> opening the abdominal cavity. A thoracotomy is a general term that means to open the uh, thorax. How that's done can be you know, it's done in many different ways. Um, lots of your laparotomies are now done how? Um, we call it laparoscopy, yeah. right? Minimally invasive techniques. You have an open technique and a laparoscopic technique. And when anything is done open, what do we mean by that? Old school, right? You go old school and you make an incision, whereas laparoscopically you're inserting cameras and then you're inserting your instruments through a small hole port as well and you're performing that laparoscopically. You guys, you guys cool with that? Cool. All right, so let's just start at, in no particular order here, I'm not necessarily following the book, but these are covered in the book, but let's start at diverticulosis. And first of all, what is diverticulosis? The presence of diverticula. What are diverticula? The little out pouches. Mm -hmm. The little out pouches <clears throat> where in the GI tract? In the large valve, right? Mm -hmm. This is a large intestine. Now, just because you have diverticulosis, does that necessarily mean you're going to have problems? No. No. What is the problematic manifestation of diverticulosis? Diverticulitis. Yeah. So diverticulitis is a problem. And how does that present? Or first of all, what is it? Inflammation. Inflammation. Well, the little pouches get inflamed. They get packed into the stool, um, right? And we say the diet for diverticulosis patients, you know, you want to take out nuts and things that can get caught in those pouches, right? How do these patients often present? Where though? left lower quadrant. Yeah, this tends to be a, a left <coughs> lower quadrant abdominal pain issue. Okay, what else? They can have a fever. Yes, they can have fever, chills. What else? They may have rectal bleeding. They might have bleeding, right? 
and the bleeding very well may be bright red, right? Because do you have significant digestion occurring in your large bowel? No. Okay, so it may be frank, bright red bleeding versus the melana, black and tarry or clay colored, right? Okay, you guys okay with that? Good deal, good deal. How would we treat these patients? What's that? Hey, how about that? Supportive care, right? IV, 12 lead O2, uh, might we need to give anti-emetics? Yeah, anti-emetic therapy as well as pain, pain medicines? Okay, good, good. Um, and you know, 12 lead, rule line them out as many things as you can. Okay, so let's now move from diverticulitis over to appendicitis. And what is appendicitis? Inflammation of the appendix. In, inflammation of the appendix. And uh, where, classically, does this pain occur? McBurney's point in what quadrant? Right. Right lower. Lower. The right lower quadrant. So you can see how this is contrasted starkly from diverticulitis. And might these patients have fever and chills? Yes. 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 All right. Might they have nausea and vomiting, just like these guys here? Yes. Yeah. All right. And as appendicitis progresses, they tend to get sicker and sicker. And what may occur if the appendix ruptures? Eventually, they may develop something called peritonitis. What is peritonitis? And the peritoneal cavity itself, right? Remember, every cavity in your body is lined with connective tissue, right? The mediastinum, for example, is surrounded by the pericardial cavity. The thoracic cavity is surrounded by the pleura, right? And, and it's exactly the same as the abdominal cavity, right? It is also surrounded by a visceral and a parietal um, lining as well, right? The peritoneum, visceral peritoneum and parietal. That can become inflamed. And um, this is what we call peritonitis, fetal life threatening. You guys, you guys okay with that? What can happen in the acute setting though if the appendix ruptures? It's kind of, it goes contrary to what you might think. Oh, and it feel good. They may actually feel better. Your patient might actually feel better for a certain amount of time, okay? And then they begin to develop peritonitis and may go on to develop sepsis, septicemia, septic shock, et cetera, right? Okay. All right, so how are we gonna treat patients suspected of having appendicitis? Hey, how about that, right? Exactly the same as many of these abdominal complaints. Now, in a lot of these cases, are a lot of these problems going to fall under the umbrella of, of an acute abdomen? Yes, right? A lot of these problems mm -hmm. are going to fall under the umbrella of the acute abdomen. And you may not be able to differentiate one from another out in the field, but you can differentiate a sick versus not sick patient, right? And so a lot of the cases, these are going to need to be transported to a facility capable of taking care of them, right? So if you're, say, uh, over in the hatch area, and you have somebody with one of these complaints, and let's say that you're closer to truth or consequences, okay, would you want to take them to TRC, to Sierra Vista Hospital there? And this isn't necessarily dig against the hospital, but what do we know about the capabilities of that facility? They don't have them. They're non-surgical capable, right? They do not have definitive surgical capabilities. So if you have somebody with an abdominal complaint, um, you probably would want to think twice about taking them to a place like Sierra Vista, and rather you would want to bypass that facility and go to Crucis, right? 
because we know that both Mountain View and more, uh, Mountain View Regional and Memorial Medical Center have general vascular surgical capabilities, right? They can do a laparotomy if this is in fact an acute act. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're in, right in TRC and you're a minute or two away from the hospital, that's might be a different, there's a different story there, right? Because in that case, that truly is um, the closest facility and it is a fully equipped ER, just not an OR. Again, these are decisions that you, you kind of have to make um, depending on where you live and work. Okay, very good. Um, let's move now over to cholecystitis. What is cholecystitis? The inflammation of the gallbladder. Of the gallbladder, right? And what often causes this? Gallstones. Good. Yeah, the accumulation of gallstones. And how do these oops, how do these patients often present? Okay, where where is this pain? Yeah, right upper quadrant pain and tenderness, right? And this is what sign again? Can Murphy. Is it Murphy's sign? The under the rib. Yeah, under the rib. Yeah. Is that Murphy's sign? Yes. Boom! You guys got it. Make me question myself. <laughs> and you, you're right though, you got it, yeah, Murphy's sign, right? Good, good. Um, I was going to say, is that McBurney's sign? Are you sure? No. <laughs> no, you, yeah, Mur the positive Murphy sign, right? And when does this pain typically occur? What is significant about a history? Usually it's after injection of high fat. Good, so following meals. Following meals particularly meals high in fat, right? Why? Because that's when your gallbladder is being signaled to release bile into the small intestine to emulsify and digest that fat. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And what are the classic Fs of cholecystitis? There's some fat, female. Good, so female, fat, 40, and fertile. Okay, these are the this is this is the classic or the textbook patient for having cholecystitis. Someone who who is is a female, a little overweight, um, around forty ish. Okay, middle age ish, and still childbearing. These tend to be patients um, that are going to be the highest risk categories for developing cholecystitis. Uh, obviously. Lots of people have this, but this tends to be more common in this demographic, if you will. And it also tends to be exceptionally common or more common in pregnancy. Okay, we see these attacks occur in, in pregnancy. You guys, you guys cool with that? All right. How can these patients present uh, in addition to the right upper quadrant pain following meals and the history? What are some other fever? Uh, huh? Fever. Hey, how about that? <laughs> Just fever, chills. How about nausea and vomiting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nausea, vomiting. Cool. How are we going to manage them? Just guess. <laughs> Supportive care. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. Blah blah blah. Right. The same same old stuff. Right. Supportive care. Now, might we want to be potentially cautious about narcotics? Yes. Because, again, there's that whole sphincter of OD, um, ampule of water issue. Uh, but in general, if they're in a lot of pain, we're gonna give them narcotics. And then we're gonna give them more narcotics if, if they need it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, opioids, good, good. All right, um, very good. Now let's move on to Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, I, I put these together. They are separate conditions, but there's a similar pathophysiology occurring in these, um, these diseases. And um, what's the underlying problem going on with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis? Chronic inflammatory diseases. Yeah, these are both chronic inflammation, and how do these patients present? 
Yeah, so they have um, obviously abdominal pain, and that abdominal pain can be, it's not necessarily focused like these guys here, right? Can be in general areas. Can they have nausea and vomiting? Yes. Nausea and vomiting. But what is one of the classic things associated with these? Uh, diarrhea. Diarrhea, right? They, they can have a chronic diarrhea, and they can have attacks that come and go, right? Because these are chronic illnesses. This is something somebody has to deal with for their life. And this is a life, it's like diabetes. It's like multiple sclerosis. It's a chronic, lifelong problem that they have to deal with. So what kinds of medications will you often see these patients on? Huh? Medications. Huh? Yeah, or medications that alter the immune system. So immune, immune system modifying drugs are what we will often see. Right. And now, uh, typically you'd look at that and you'd go, oh, that's possibly someone with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, right? That's kind of what we, we often think of, right? They have, they have psoriasis, they have lupus, they may have a rheumatoid arthritis. You know, those are some of the chronic things that you think of. Um, but you also want to consider the possibility of Crohn's disease and ulcerative um, colitis. You guys, guys good with that? Mm -hmm. um, now, the main difference from a clinical standpoint in Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis is that um, Crohn's disease can occur anywhere along the GI tract, from basically from your mouth to your anus. Whereas ulcerative colitis tends to be more specific to the large intestine. You guys okay with that? The large bowel? Mm -hmm. um, which means that in some cases, uh, removing the large bowel might be curative in somebody with ulcerative colitis, where that's not necessarily the case when it comes to Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease in some cases can be more difficult to manage because of that. Um, and what is the term that we, we use for removing part of the bowel? If you read this on somebody's chart. So otomy, right? Otomy means removal, right? Or ectomy, rather, excuse me, otomy is a hole. There we go. Ectomy is removal, excuse me. Colonectomy. Colonectomy, there we go. Colonectomy, right? Or removal part of the, the bowel. Or if we're talking about the small bowel, we'll we'll define which which of the three parts of the small bowel, right? So an iliectomy would be Removal part of the ileum, right? A du duodenectomy would be part of the duodenum, right? You guys you look at that? And in some patients that have a significant part of their bowel removed, will actually go on to develop something known as short bowel syndrome. Have you guys ever heard of that? This is where you have um, a significant portion of your intestine removed, which means you're going to have issues with digestion, right? Specifically, you're going to have issues getting enough nutrients into your body. In some cases, patients with this will actually, actually require something known as TPN. What does TPN stand for? Total Parenteral Nutrition. Total Parenteral Nutrition. Not a feeding tube. IV. 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 Yeah. Yeah. What a pain. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so occasionally run into this patients. We occasionally run into this in very sick patients, right? Because what do you know what happens when you're placed under a lot of stress? Huh? Immune system. Yeah. So your immune system gets suppressed, right? 
what else get right? Because remember, we said sympathetic response is shut down, shut down things that aren't immediately vital. Oh, yeah, so it it shuts, down down the same thing. shuts down your GI system as well, right? When you place somebody on a lot of stress, right? So their bowels quit moving, right? right? Their bowels move. Sometimes you evacuate, right? You vomit. You know, get everything out. Shut those things down. We don't need them. We need to do to divert energy and resources to critical areas of the body. So when people get critically ill, their GI system does have a tendency to shut down, which means they can't digest, which means sometimes we have to do TPN on critically ill and injured patients because their GI system is shut down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That is different. That is not tube feeding. Mm -hmm. Tube feeding is where you feed them through a gastric tube, either through the mouth, nose, or sometimes the tube is inserted directly into their stomach, through their abdominal wall, something called a PEG tube, for example, a peripheral inserted gastrostomy tube. And those tend to be due to uh, like tumors or damage or inability to swallow or something like that. If you guys is okay with that. Um, but yeah, short bowel syndrome, so something a little different. Now also, even though it's not up on the board, since we're talking about surgical techniques, Okay, there's also something known as a resection. So a bowel resection. And what, what's the difference between a colectomy or an ileectomy and a resection, for example? Is it attaching a portion to a different section? There you go. Right. So yeah, so a colonectomy just literally means removal of part of your colon, your large bowel, or an ileectomy would be removal of you know, part of the ileum. But what a resection is, is when you come in, and so let's say that you have your, your bowel here, and you have some sort of anomaly here. What you will do is you will cut this area out, right? Okay, so you'll do your otomy, and then Okay, those open areas are then sutured back together. That's called re-onostomosis or onostomosis or anastomosis. Okay, so onostomosis or anastomosis means the same thing, right? And we'll resect those, we'll put those ends together. Does that, does that make sense? Now, occasionally what we'll do is we won't resect the bowel, but rather we will pull part of the bowel through the abdominal lining. We'll make a stoma out of that, right? So the, the bowel, the inside, part of the inside will come out and then we'll suture it to the abdominal wall. And then you have a stoma there coming out of the abdominal, right? And then we would call that a, depending on what gets pulled through the abdominal wall, we would call it an ileostomy if the ileum was involved we would call it a colonostomy if the colon is involved, the large, large intestine is involved. Does that, that make sense? You guys okay with that? Agree with that means? Good, good deal. Um, when it comes to transporting somebody with an ileostomy or a colonostomy or um, what, whatever the case may be, an ostomy of some sort, what are, basic, what are some basic considerations? Don't squeeze it back. Okay. All right. So you want to make sure that it's attached correctly and sealed. What else? Particularly when you're going up and down over over terrain. Make sure it doesn't become unattached. Okay. Make sure it doesn't become unattached. What else? Thinking about no. gas laws, physics. What goes up must come down. No. Talk about gas laws. Going back to uh, respiratory, right? Pressure. What happens with pressure? Are you talking about, you're talking, about, oh, you're talking about like extreme elevations? You got to make well, sure. Well, not even necessarily extreme, but you know, the pressure is going to change. There's pressure going to change. That doesn't hold with pressure. I don't know. Sure. Right, Boyle's law. Yeah. Right, pressure and volume have an inverse relationship. Right. So if, if you're taking somebody over to El Paso and you have to go over the Gap or you have to go over Trans Mountain, what might happen? Build up pressure. Right. Well, pressure is going to decrease, right, as you go up, yes. which will cause the volume to increase in that bag, and so you can have expansion 
of um, your bags at altitude, right? So occasionally, you may need to do what's called burping the bag, right? Where you actually just pop it open a little bit, burp the air out, and then seal it back up, right? Huh? It can be, yeah. It can be, for sure. Why well, don't um, chip truck, truck drivers don't take like the sit in the batteries and stuff? Yeah, you don't want you know, all your chips, will, bags will pop. You know, pop, pop, pop. Um, a lot of the newer bags actually have a little vent built into them, so they're self-venting, but occasionally not. You guys, he's okay with that? All right, cool. And then you just want to you want to document what you see in the bag too, right? What does it look like? What color is it? Is it solid? Is it liquid? Does it look, does it look like there's any blood in it? Okay, There's those kinds of things. Okay, cool. All right, so you guys are okay with what an ectomy versus a resection is? Okay. Resection is not the same thing as an ostomy though, right? Because if you resect it, that means that you brought them back together. All right. Okay, you guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Cool, all right. Um, so let's move now over, uh, well, you know what, since we're talking about the bowel, let's just move over here and talk about bowel obstruction. What is a bowel obstruction? This is a obstructing bowel. Yeah, a, a blockage, right? of either the large bowel or the small bowel. And these are known as small bowel obstructions and large bowel obstructions, or SBO and LBO. Okay, if you see that on a chart, that's, that's what those mean. Um, and what kinds of things can cause obstructions? <coughs> Severe constipation. Okay, so constipation. What, what's, what are common causes of, of constipation? Narcotics. Narcotics, right? Op well, opioids. Opioids in general, um, very, very common. Good. Getting older, right? Coming older, right? Um, being dehydrated, having a diet that is low in fiber. Okay. What other things can cause bowel obstructions? If you had to imagine. Foreign body. Okay, maybe a foreign body. What else? A little twisting of the bowel. Okay, so you can have abnormal anatomical problems, twisting, things like that. Um, Huh? Hernia, right? Do you guys know what a hernia is? I've experienced it, that's why I wasn't. Okay, yeah, hernia is where a part, well, when we talk about the abdominal pelvic cavities, a hernia is where um, you have a tear in the muscle, and then you have bowel contents pop through that tear in the muscle, okay? Um, and we tend to get hernias in, in, in distinct areas. You can get what's called an abdominal wall hernia. This is a hernia, generally of the anterior portion. Okay, of the abdomen. What's that? My daughter has one, like a little bit inside. One, yeah. Since like birth, it's only like yeah. this big. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can. So severe, they had to put like a mesh over it. Yep. Yep. And it's like going surgically repair it. Yeah. Put put mesh and yeah, sew it down. Um, that's abdominal wall hernia. You can also get what are called inguinal hernias, where you have a ligament in your groin, and you can have herniation of that through that ligament in your groin. Um, in men, it can actually herniate into the, the, the testes, right? You get loops of bowel in your testes. It's called an inguinal hernia. Isn't that picture? And that's one of the things, and you guys are familiar with sports physicals, right? Mm -hmm. And where, where the physician will actually uh, put his or her hand kind of into your testicular sac, have you cough. And what that will do is that coughing might cause opening of that, that, that tore muscle area or cause the bowel to move around and they, they feel for that. Um, you can also have what's called a femoral or, or, uh, herniation as well. And you can get herniation through um, your femoral area as well. Um, women can have um, herniations of the, the, the pelvis and the vaginal wall as well. And, um, occasionally that can be problematic, um, obviously. Okay. Uh, if you see a hernia or you suspect a herniation, there's not much you can do about it, right? You can do supportive care, you can chart it, you can monitor it, you can get the patient where they need to go. What's really the, if you suspect a hernia, what is your what? What are you really worried about? Even more than obstruction, ischemia, right? Incarceration of that bowel and loss of blood supply and necrosis of that bowel that that 
piece that yeah that can be that's really what we're, what we're most concerned about is that incarceration and, and necrosis okay what are some other things that can lead to bowel obstruction really really good things you guys are throwing at me though really really good things what about cancer tumors yes yes neoplasms right can also cause it and something known as an ileus have you guys ever heard of the term ileus these this is a is common a term an ileus huh is it a specific tumor no it's not a tumor oh. at all actually an ileus ileus is a term that means a portion of your bowel is unable to undergo peristaltic activity. So basically, peristalsis has quit in a certain area of your bowel. Okay. So the muscles, for a variety of reasons, sometimes it's what we call a paralytic ileus, where you have a neurological issue and you have paralysis of that muscle. Okay, but many things, there are all obviously other causes, but for whatever the reason, peristalsis stops in that area and if peristalsis stops in that area, the risk of a bowel obstruction in that area increases pretty substantially, right? Mm -hmm. Now, might you still have movement of chyme or chyme through that area even if there is an ileus? Yes. Yes, so it doesn't necessarily mean bowel obstruction, but it increases the risk. So are you guys okay with what the difference between an ileus and a bowel obstruction is? An ileus can certainly lead to a bowel obstruction. And clinically, these are very hard to tell apart. You can't really tell these apart clinically without getting x-rays, getting labs, getting CT scan is really what we want to look at with contrast, right? We're going to need good contrast. That's cool, Pat. Um, coincidentally, what's the difference between contrast and dye? I hate, I hate it when people do this, so I want to make sure you guys are okay. Have you ever heard of somebody say, I'm allergic to iodine dye? Contrast is radio. radio. It feels like it it's lights up. It's a radio. Well, what, what does it mean to dye something? It changes color. It changes, it changes color, color yeah. right? And contrast is just to be able to see it. Okay, yeah, so contrast absorbs x rays, right? And contrast doesn't dye, right? Mm -hmm. Contrast just flows through, and as it flows through, the, it absorbs the x-rays, and then it, it goes on its way. But when you dye something, you actually change its color, its visible color. Right? So there is a difference between con what we call contrast media and dye. And even though a lot of people use those terms interchangeably, they're not really interchangeable. So there you go. Okay, cool. Um, there are two types of contrast when it comes to abdominal um, uh, radiology, there is what we call IV contrast, which is given I intravenously. How about that? And there is oral contrast, which is given oral. orally, or sometimes we give it rectally as, as well. We'll inject it. Upper and lower GI. Yeah, upper and lower GI series. Yeah. Um, one thing that you guys need to know, because you will be in the ER, you'll be spending a lot of time in the emergency room working with patients with abdominal pain, because abdominal pain is a very common complaint. And guess what? Somebody who's uh, been spent a dozen years of their life in medical school has a hard time figuring out what the hell's going on with abdominal pain. So a lot of abdominal pain patients are going to have radiology done on them. Um, one of the things we need to be very careful about is if they get IV contrast, there are some critical medication interactions. Very common medication interacts very negatively with contrast media. And that is metformin. Remember what metformin is? It's glucophage. What is it? It's an oral anti-hyperglycemic, anti right? Yeah, it works on the pancreas. Um, people that take glucophage or metformin and get contrast media are at incredibly high risk for developing a severe metabolic acidosis, like life-threatening metabolic acidosis if they get contrast media. Okay, so we like to see them off of their metformin for at least 24 to 48 hours before they get contrast, okay? It is possible if you have somebody that has 
an acute abdomen and you're taking care of them in the ER, things start happening, right? Yes. And things get ordered, right? And I know this happens because you guys do this all the time in your scenarios where you have somebody who's dying on you. I'm going to get a blood pressure. What? No. No, you don't want a blood pressure right now. <laughs> right? But this happens in the hospital as well. Let's get them to let's get them to CT scan. Let's do a I, uh, let's do IV contrast, right? Let's do a stat CT of the abdomen and pelvis of IV contrast. We need to figure out what's going on, and that gets ordered before we kind of look at all the meds and, and, and what's going on, right? So think about that. The other thing we need to think about with contrast is certain types of contrast use iodine in them, and a lot of patients have iodine allergies and intolerances, right? So it's kind of contraindicated, right? There Now there are alternative types of contrast which don't use iodine that, that might be um, substituted, okay? So things to think about, right? If, you, if you're taking care of your patient and they start ordering these things, okay, you know. Now what's supposed to happen is the x-ray technologist is supposed to review this stuff before they take the patient x-ray but guess what have you guys seen what x-ray technologists are doing in the hospital have you ever worked around them yes okay yeah. but have you seen what they do yes they get x-ray after x-ray after x-ray they get order after order after order after order after order it's like working in a lab right you draw blood and it just doesn't freaking stop and you kind of just get into you just do it, right? You just do stuff, right? And so you can't always, you just, you, you have to, you also have to play a role in, in, um, in picking <coughs> these things up as well. You guys, you guys cool with that? No. If they yeah. have uh, an acute abdomen, uh -huh. they, need, I, or they need a CT with contrast. Yes. And they are on metformin or something of the sort that does have these nasty yeah. in, uh, Thank you. Interactions. What are they going to do about that? Uh, we may not have. We may not be able to give them contrast. And just hope you pick it up without contrast. And may do a CT without contrast. How long do they need to be off? Of Twenty-four or forty-eight hours. Yeah. Um, so we may not do. It, so we may do a CT without contrast. We'll have a radiologist look at it. We'll make. We'll get as much information as we can, and then a decision has to be made. And occasionally there is something known as an exploratory laparotomy. You guys ever heard that term? Yes. And the exploratory laparotomy is we're not sure what the hell's going on, but we think it's something bad. So we're going to open you up and we're going to go old school. We're going to open you up and we're going to see what we see. And if then we'll, we'll take whatever action needs to be taken at that time. So that may be a situation where it's like, well, we, we don't, we're not sure if the appendix is bad or not. So we're gonna do. We're, you know what? We're we're gonna we're gonna explore. We're gonna open you up. We're gonna take a look. Yeah, we're gonna take a look and see see what we see. That's and that, that is something known as an exploratory laparotomy, and it happens a lot actually. It happens a lot. Abdominal pain can be tough to work work up, right? And I can't do. I just can't even do it justice in you know the the day or two that we get to spend talking about it. But there you go. Okay. Um, so an ileus can also lead to a bowel obstruction. So what, what is the, the presentation? What is somebody with a small bowel obstruction, how are they often presenting? Okay, so it's excruciatingly painful, for sure. What else? Okay, might. Yes, the typical presentation for someone with a small bowel is excessive nausea and vomiting, okay? And in fact, they may start vomiting what? Fecal. fecal matter, right? They may start vomiting fecal matter. That can't be good, right? It's not, right? Yeah, right. So they tend to present very ill with a small bowel obstruction. Um, and what's worse is, we might think, oh, because their bowel is obstructed, they don't have bowel movements, right? Wrong. You can have a bowel obstruction, right? Yeah. But you can still have liquid 
getting around that obstruction. So they may even have diarrhea. And you're like, well, they have diarrhea, stuff's getting through. No, nope, they actually have a small bowel. <laughs> right? Does that, does that kind of make sense? Okay. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fecal matter in their vomit. Okay. Very painful and very tender. All right. How does that differ from, say, a large bowel obstruction? This is somebody who, yeah, who has more of a constipation like presentation, you know, where they haven't had a bowel movement, they feel plugged up, they may have some pain, they may have some nausea, um, they typically, or they, they may not though, they may not have significant pain or nausea and vomiting. Um, so it tends to be maybe a bit more subtle. It doesn't have to be, but it tends to be. Um, in both cases, what do you think is going to be very important for these patients? IV a fluid, they need it. Um, and guess what? Gastric decompression. Yeah, a gastric tube. Specifically with your small bowel obstruction. In fact, in some cases, just resting the bowel by putting a gastric tube in, making them PO, decompressing their stomach, going some intermittent suction for a day or two, just that may resolve the bowel obstruction spontaneously. Yeah. Um, so that actually is a very important part of managing somebody with a, a bowel obstruction. And you'll see this in the, in the ER. You have somebody and they find a bowel obstruction. Um, one of the things that they will order is a gastric tube. Um, how would you want to put it in someone with a bowel? Nasal or oral? Nasal. Go nasal, right? It's much more it's easy, much easier to tolerate nasally, right? You guys, you guys cool with that? Okay, cool. And we've actually already talked about gastric intubation, so you, you guys have done that and you know how to do that. Okay, uh, let's move on to, uh, from bowel obstruction over to pancreatitis. Okay, what is pancreatitis? Well, the pancreas, right? It can be bacterial, it can be viral. What condition do you what condition have we talked about so far? Do you suppose predisposes somebody to pancreatitis? Cholecystitis. Cholecystitis, right? Because this is the same duct work that we're dealing with, cystic duct, the common bile duct, and you can get stones that can obstruct these, right? In fact, there's actually a procedure that is done when um, we suspect a a stone may be occluding the pancreas. Um, and that's called an MRCP, I believe, right? Or no, that's that's a that's uh, using MRI to look at the pancreas and gallbladder. An ERCP, excuse me, it's called an ERCP. It basically involves <laughs> just taking a little a little camera and some little tongs and going up in there, looking around. Oh, there's a little obstruction. Pull it out. Yeah. <clears throat> MRCP is a magnetic using magnetic resonance resonance imaging to look at the, uh, the um, gallbladder and the, uh, the uh, pancreas. Okay, yeah, so um, what we call cholelithiases. Um, a lith just kind of means stone, right? Like neat, you guys remember the terms neolithic, paleolithic, and mesolithic, Do those terms mean anything to you guys? talking about um, ancient uh, man, a hominid. So uh, paleolithic is what? Pre, paleo, pre stone age. Mesolithic is middle, I believe, middle stone age. And then you have what? Neolithic is the new stone age. And then you move into your Iron Age, your Bronze Age, etc. Totally unrelated to this, right? <laughs> there you go. Uh, we actually actually had a history major in um, at one of my students, Chris Paws. I think he's a history major, right? Chris? Yeah. Yeah. And I always <laughs> ask him about like history stuff. He's like, well, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just a history major. I don't know history. <laughs> he's a pretty cool guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, one of the coolest uh, guys was uh, uh, Mustache. Always had a mustache. Tracy. 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 Yeah. 
Nathan. Yeah, I saw him this morning. Because nothing seemed to rattle him. Oh, that I, I've been trying for years to get nothing that guy. That seems to rattle him. this guy. He's like, okay. Nathan, you just completely killed your patient. You're, you're an absolute failure. Okay. <laughs> I love the way he doesn't care. <laughs> well, I mean, he, he cares, but I mean, he just doesn't get rattled. Nothing rattles this guy. He insults him. He's like, all right. All right. Yeah. Right yeah. And then you had him. I had him and Paul in the same one. And, oh, and talk about too. diametric opposition. Man. <laughs> just, it, wow. But anyway, totally, totally unrelated stuff. All right, so going back to pancreatitis, what do you suppose the biggest risk factor for developing pancreatitis is going to be? The biggest risk factor. Diabetes. And anybody who has a history of this with abdominal pain, you need to assume pancreatitis. Alcohol. Alcohol. Yeah. Alcohol use is your biggest risk factor. Yeah. Alcohol. Okay. Remember, what life-threatening problem is is uh, highly strongly associated with pancreatitis? This is on your quiz, actually. Arms. Arms. Yeah. Arms. What metabolic or uh, what endocrine derangement is going to be more common with pancreatitis? DKA. Not DKA. Yeah, yeah it's a hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non-ketotic coma even in non-diabetic patients. <coughs> All right, you guys okay with that? Okay. Um, how does pancreatitis present? What do these patients look like? Right upper quadrant. What's that? Right upper quadrant. Right upper quadrant or left upper quadrant? Right. Left upper quadrant. Left upper quadrant. Right. 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 Left upper Good. So right and oh, uh, mid of the gastric area. There we go. It says right Good. and mid. Good. Right and mid. Right. You guys okay? Trick us. No, I'm not trying to trick you. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Right. Your pancreas is kind of weirdly located. Right. Oh, okay. it's, kind of it's kind of non-localized. Right. So yeah. So right, right in the the mid, your mid, kind of your epigastrum. Okay. And then maybe a little bit to the right, and, 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 and remember, it kind of goes behind the gallbladder in the liver. Okay, so it's it's toward the back of your your abdominal cavity, and that's why you can sometimes get flank pain. Right, you can get CVA tenderness, and you can get Gray Turner's sign, the bruising along the flank with pancreatitis, because the pancreas is posterior to the major abdominal organs, the, the, the liver and the gallbladder. It, it is actually behind there, and it makes sense that it would be close, right? It would be on the right side because it dumps stuff into the biliary um, ductwork. Does that, that make sense? Okay, so the problem with pancreatitis is you have inflammation of the pancreas, and you have a backup of pancreatic enzymes, right? And so they, they kind of start digesting the pancreas. It's called autodigestion. Well, that can't be a fun thing, right? To have an organ digesting itself, right? And so in addition to this, this right, this right in mid gastric kind of pain, how, 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 how else might these patients present? Okay, good. Fever? Good. Nausea, vomiting. All right. And they may even present with dyspnea. Okay, with dyspnea or difficulty breathing. All right. Coincidentally, what pulmonary problem is really good at masquerading as an abdominal problem? It's a pulmonary problem. Talked about this in pulmonology. Very good at masquerading as an abdominal problem. Pneumonia. Pneumonia, right? Yeah. Right. One of the major signs and symptoms of pneumonia is abdominal pain. Yes. Just cool with that. All right. Um, okay. Good. 
Uh, pancreatitis can be fatal, right? And there's something that we'll do in the hospital called Ransom's Criteria. You don't have to remember how to do it because you need labs to do it. We look at Ransom's Criteria to find out what their, their risk of uh, mor morbidity and mortality is. Right? How are we going to treat somebody suspected of having pancreatitis in the field? Hey, how about that low hanging fruit, right? Supportive care, IVO2, antiemetics, get a good history, get a 12 lead on them, um, give them a nar narcot or give them um, opioid analgesics if they if they need it. Okay, and again, you always have to rule out maybe there could be some sphincter or bony ampulla water problems. Okay, you guys cool with that? Um, let's move on to uh, mesenteric ischemia. We've talked about this in cardiology, but what is it? Just to, to be complete here. It's, it's a lack of uh, blood flow to the bowel. So generally, it's a clot, yeah. right? It's a clot that occludes your mesenteric artery. artery, you know, somewhere, and you have acute ischemic bowel. This presents with diffuse excruciating abdominal pain, right? These patients have diffuse excruciating abdominal pain, and the rest of their exam is completely unremarkable, right? Their belly is soft. You don't feel any masses in there. Their, their x-ray is, is normal. Their labs might not be particularly um, noteworthy. You're like, what is going on? And so anytime you have severe abdominal pain out of proportion with the rest of your exam, you want to think about mesenteric ischemia. Right? That's an acute vascular emergency. We need, we need to get in there. We need to, we need to resolve that, that clot and reestablish circulation of the bowel. You guys, you guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right. And then finally, I want to, uh, well, not finally, but I do want to talk about hepatitis real quick. How many forms of hepatitis? Well, what is hepatitis, first of all? Inflammation of the liver. Inflammation of the liver. <laughs> okay. And how many forms do we have? A lot. A lot. Lots and lots and lots. The major forms are A, B, and C. These are the ones we run into a lot. What? How does A present? There you go. It presents as gastroenteritis, as an acute gastroenteritis with jaundice. And what is jaundice? What is what causes that yellowing of skin, mucous membranes? Increased levels of bilirubin. Right, the liver is not able to conjugate that bilirubin and dump it into the bile. You guys, you guys, okay with that? Now, what about B and C? What are these? B depends on how you initially get it. It can be either acute or chronic. Okay. So if you get like a hardcore system initially, it usually goes acute. All right. But B and C tend to be chronic viral illnesses. Yeah. Right. When you when you, like A, you get over it, right? You get it. You get sick. Bam, yeah, you're done, awesome. right? B and C, when you get them they more or less tend to be chronic lifelong issues, right? Um, that we may have to deal with for, for years, decades, possibly life, lifetime. Um, there's a yeah, there is actually new therapy out for C now, isn't there? My father-in-law. Curative. Yeah. It, 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 and it's... Yep. Well, you, what was yeah. it? They said... Uh, you take a dose. You're cured. The definition of cured is like... I forgot the way they defined it. You have to be very careful. It's like so many months without yeah. a... You have to be real careful. A, you know, sign of the virus. Yeah, your viral <laughs> load. Right, your viral load. Is viral low. load, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is an effective cure, we'll yeah. say. Mm -hmm. Effective cure. Um, B, there is no cure for chronic. And some people that get B will actually get over it, or they will, they will um, not have problems with it lifelong. They may still carry it, though. <laughs> um, C to some extent. Um, B and C are both. What's the concern with chronic manifestations of B and C? Like safety concern, or yeah, just with your patient. Exposure. Okay, so exposure, right? Because both B and C are bloodborne, right? Mm -hmm. Bloodborne, um, and to some extent, sexually transmitted as well, right? Although C is 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 tends to be a little harder to transmit sexually, um, but chronic liver failure, right? Yeah. Chronic liver failure. We talked a little
little bit about chronic liver failure. When your liver fails, your portal pressures get high, so you can get the ascites in your abdomen. You can get the elevation of pneumonia, and you can get that, um, that hepatic encephalopathy, right? Um, and you can have coagulopathies due to loss of uh, clotting factors, right? Those are all problems associated with, with chronic liver failure. Um, and what common condition can result in that liver failure? Right? And what common condition will, will, will cause that? Cirrhosis. Cirrhosis, right? You have a cirrhotic liver. Your normal healthy liver tissue, your hepatocytes, in, um, um, are basically replaced by scarry, fatty tissue. That's called cirrhosis. Okay. Um, in addition to hepatitis, what else can, is a major cause of cirrhosis? Alcohol, chronic alcohol, and what else? Very common. We talked about, we have actually talked about this already, but. So alcohol brings the cirrhosis? Well, we already, yeah, you, you, you guys have already got alcohol. I'm not giving it to you again. <laughs> no, you already so used just taking it up with the oh, Yeah, okay. I was just double checking okay. that. Yeah, so alcoholic cirrhosis, yeah. Yeah. Cirrhosis. What else? Huh? Cirrhosis. No, it's a common. So, very, we actually talked about this yesterday, too. Acetaminophen. Oh, yeah. yeah. Acetaminophen is a big cause of this. Yes. Acetaminophen, alcohol. Okay. And then there's actually something. I actually have this this problem. I have this disease. It's something called non-alcoholic fatty stetosis, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And basically, it's where fat starts replacing your your liver, but you don't drink, you don't take hot or anything like that. Um, and that's actually what I have, um, uh, mainly due to really, really poor lifestyle. Um, so the good thing about that is, you know, if you catch it early enough and you change your lifestyle, it may, may reverse. And I think about 10% of people with non-alcoholic fatty cetosis will actually go on to develop a full-on cirrhosis. Now there is a sudden, um, a sudden deterioration in your liver where people have sudden liver failure, and that's known as fulminant, right? Remember when we talked about fulminating pulmonary edema? This is pulmonary edema that happens really quickly, right? And they start having white frothy sputum, they deteriorate very, very quickly. This can happen with liver failure as well. It's called fulminant or fulminating hepatic failure or liver failure, where their liver shuts down real quickly. And we see this like with a massive Tylenol overdose, for example, where your liver shuts down real quickly and they develop sudden coagulopathies, sudden encephalopathy, right? They get really jaundiced, they get really sick really quickly. Is that, you guys, you guys okay with that? Okay. How do we support patients with hepatitis, they just with hepatic problems in general? Supportive. Supportive care, right? Not much we can do. We may need to administer blood products to them to replace clotting factors. Oftentimes, Liver failure will stress what other organ system? <laughs> kidneys. kidneys, right? Because the kidneys are your major organ of elimination, right? Kidneys are eliminating a lot of the metabolic by byproducts that are produced in the liver. And so often what you'll see is you will see uh, something called hepatorenal syndrome, where both your kidneys and your liver begin to fail at the same time because of the stress that the failing liver puts on the kidneys. It's a very common Binding. We'll be talking about kidneys here uh, soon enough after the break. Okay, you guys, you guys cool with that? Um, hepatitis B, the virus tends to be a bit, a bit sturdier, if you will, than C, right? And so hepatitis B can, can um, I don't want to say survive because it's not really alive until the cell is infected, but the virus particle can remain active for a much longer time outside the body, like weeks versus hepatitis C is gen tends to be a bit more, more fragile, right? You guys, you guys okay there? There are vaccinations for A and B, right? Yeah. And probably most of you have had uh, A, and well, and most of you probably had B as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, and uh, I actually my, was spared uh, hepatitis due to my vac vaccination. Uh, 
Hep, hep B vaccination. I was uh, uh, had a needle stick. Uh, I was working with a guy in um, liver failure um, due to hepatitis B. Um, he was an old old veteran. He had actually gotten it through a blood transfusion, and I was drawing blood from him, and um, um, the the needle from the vacutainer went through my glove. And I poked myself. What happened to my thumb? not get hepatitis B, even though it was a, a very significant exposure that I had, a large hollow needle full of blood. Pretty significant exposure. Yeah. Uh, I did have to go on the whole HIV prophylaxis, which was not fun at all. I had lots of diarrhea and uh, yeah, it didn't feel, feel well. Okay. All right. Um, some people with hepatitis C will go on interferon treatments as well. It, it, and it can be very similar to chemotherapy. Um, so they can, they can be very tired, they have a lot of pain, they can be immunosuppressed, et cetera. Okay, um, real quickly, we'll talk about these real quick, and then I'll get you guys on a break, and then we will start with nephrology and urology, but we won't by no means finish it. So just some, and these are kind of talked about in the book, but these are more pediatric um, problems. So there's something called an intussusception, and what is an intussusception? Yeah, so the small bowel telescopes in on itself, right? Yeah, and so these patients, these kids, this is almost a pediatric disorder, they, they present with severe abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and their stool looks like red jelly or red jello coming out. And it's actually something known as current red um, stools or current red jelly stools. I mean, it literally looks like this reddish gel gelatin stuff coming out. Um, you can see, yeah, that's an intussusception. Then you have something called a volus, which is where the bowel gets twisted up around itself, kinked off and necrotic, and it has a very mesenteric ischemia-like presentation as well as a small bowel-like presentation, small bowel obstruction. You have something called pyloric stenosis. Unlike intussusception vul vulvi, which involve the small bowel, where do you suppose pyloric stenosis is occurring? Okay in the belt. stomach, right? Pyloric region of the stomach, right? Where you have the stenotic pyloric valve. And what this is, this tends to be newborns, right? What do we see in newborns? <coughs> pyloric stenosis? Projectile vomiting. Projectile vomiting, yes. Yeah. So if you're feeding your baby and then it projectile vomits, you, you get called to that complaint you need to be thinking, does this baby have pyloric stenosis? <laughs> um, upon palpation, you may feel a hardened, it kind of feels like a hard olive, right? You imagine there's like a little olive around their, their, their gastric area. That also points to the diagnosis of pyloric stenosis. And then you can also develop something known as a congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which is what? Herniation to the diaphragm. Herniation of bowel contents into the diaphragm, and we'll talk about that much more detail, um, as well as these other things in more detail in pediatrics and, and neonatology. But I just wanted to throw them out there. I think we have covered all the major gastrointestinal abdominal things. I believe we've covered all the major bases. Um, so get out of here. I'll see you guys in 10 minutes.